We're in Revelation chapter 2. We'll be looking in verses 1 through 7 in just a minute. We're in the midst of this series, just two weeks in, to this series entitled uh, The Seven, What Broke the Church. We've entitled it The Seven because Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches uh, in the book of Revelation in the first three chapters. Uh, the, the number seven is simply a number from, for completion. It's used throughout the Bible to signify something that is complete and something that is whole. So when we talk about these seven churches in Asia Minor, in ancient Turkey, we, we can't see these letters as, some, as letters that are simply written to them for their benefit, but ultimately for the whole church. Because you, you see, they symbolize the whole uh, universal and visible and local church throughout every age. The problems that they had in the first century of Christianity are the problems that we have, the things that were breaking the church in this first century are breaking the church today. Yes, our culture is a little bit different. We are a little bit more advanced in some ways. Technology is this and that. But ultimately, it really is the same issues that we're dealing with. And so we've combined with Hometown Church, Jody May, the pastor there in Dallas, to explore Jesus' words to these churches in Asia because they apply deeply and relevantly to our own lives. When we talk about the brokenness of the church, we introduced last week that the idea of brokenness is that our influence has been broken, our ability to influence the culture around us, our ability to credibly speak the gospel of Jesus Christ has been severely inhibited, inhibited over recent years. In fact, I, would, I said last week that we're hemorrhaging influence. Because the world around us doesn't look to the church anymore for answers. They would rather look to Oprah. They would l rather look to Dr. Phil for answers. For ultimately what would be band-aids to an eternal situation. And so we want to regain the credibility uh, that the church needs to speak the truth of the gospel with. We need to regain the influence that we've lost. And so we're examining what it is that's broken the church. Last week, we looked at chapter 1 as a preamble to chapters 2 and 3. Jesus is basically demonstrating for us in chapter 1 that he is the exalted Lord of the church, that he is the head of the church, he is the husband of the bride. He is the one who has the right and credibility to command us and for us to bow on our faces. John, at the end of chapter 1, fell on his face before Jesus as though dead. Because there was no option for him but to collapse beneath the weight and the presence of Jesus Christ himself. And, and, and the church is to collapse, isn't it? The church is to despair of all its own devices, all of its own gimmicks, all of its own schemes. We're to despair of all of the, those things and fall down on our knees at the feet of Jesus Christ, who's the one who can command us. The ultimate answer to what it is that's breaking the church. We could look at hypocrisy and lovelessness and self-righteousness and, and uh, uh, tolerating immorality in the church. We can look at a number of things that are breaking the church. But all of those things boil down to this. We don't listen to Jesus very well anymore. We don't listen to the authority of Jesus. We see him as a mildly suggestive figure. But Revelation 1 presented him as so much more than that so today we've already dealt with chapter one we're simply assuming jesus's authority in writing what he does to the seven churches of asia minor and ultimately to us here at the journey 
to Hometown Church, to all the churches of Paulding and Cobb County, Georgia around us, and ultimately the world. So let's read Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. We'll go through verse 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance, and how you cannot bear with those who are evil, but have tested those who call themselves apostles and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you've not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent, and do the works you did at first. If not... I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. That sentence is deeply chilling to me. That sentence is deeply chilling to me. It reaches reaches strings in my heart that are protected against most other things. But the idea that the influence of the church would be removed by the Lord of the church himself is a deeply chilling idea. He says, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Verse 6, yet this you have, you hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. All right, let's begin again in chapter, uh, in verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. Just a few things we want to note from this first verse. Number one, this message is being sent to the angel of the church in Ephesus. Now the word angel in the Greek is angelos, and angelos can actually refer simply to a messenger. So it might mean that uh, this is being sent to the human messenger, possibly most commentators would believe, the pastor of the church in Ephesus. And that could be what it means. Okay, I don't have any real issue with that if that's what it means, but every single time the word angelos in Greek is used throughout the rest of the book of Revelation, it's not referring to human messengers, it's referring to heavenly angelic beings. And so I tend to believe that Jesus is writing a letter to the angel, the protector, the minister, the heavenly divine spirit that has been created by God to minister to the people of God. I see it that every church has an angel, and that may seem strange to you, but I don't know why it would. We know that angels are real. We know that God has created them to minister to the needs of his people and to minister to the desires of God as well. So whether it means human messenger or heavenly uh, spiritual being uh, is, is up for you to determine, but this is being sent in such a way uh, that it is, it is commissioned well, it is held well, protected well, this message will make it to the church. The second thing from this verse is that Jesus is the one sending the message. Jesus is the one sending the message. Now, his credentials have already been given to us in chapter 1. They were lengthy and weighty credentials, were they not? Jesus has the authority to command us. He has the authority to write difficult things to the church of Jesus Christ. He is presented in this verse as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand. These seven stars, according to Revelation 1 at the end of that uh, chapter, are the seven angels. So Jesus holds these seven stars. He holds these seven angels in his hand. That might mean that he holds the seven pastors in his hands and protects them and guards them. But I see the bigness of Jesus in this all that Jesus holds the angels of the whole world who protect the churches of his, uh, who, who protect the churches of his creation. He holds all of the angels in his own hand. Imagine how big, how cosmic, how universal our Jesus is, right? Because he holds angels in his hands. And that's the one who is addressing the church at Ephesus. The third thing about the first verse is that Jesus is walking among the lampstands. We looked at this last week. It's simply to restate again that Jesus walks among the churches. Jesus is not unmindful of what's going on in the church. 
He hasn't wound up the church like a clock and then went to take a seat somewhere and is just watching from a distance. Jesus is walking among the churches. He knows us. He knows everything about us. He knows our struggles. He knows when it's difficult to pay the rent. He knows when, it's, uh, w- when certain things are taking place in the church that, that, that damage our credibility and our influence in the world. Jesus knows. He is continually assessing the state of the church continually. Who are we to think that we can simply do church how we want? Who are we to think that we can simply uh, go off on our own tangents and simply ride our own hobby horses and do the things that we want to do in the church? Jesus walks among the lampstands. We're called lampstands, right? Because we, we give light. We give light. We're a city set on a hill pointing to the light of the world who's Jesus himself. So he writes this message to the church at Ephesus as a counselor with perfect knowledge if you go to a therapist the only problem with the therapist ultimately is he doesn't really know you he doesn't really know your heart in fact you can pull the wool over his eyes making him to believe that you're just a victim of this or that or whatever rather than responsible for your own choices and decisions but jesus knows he's a perfect counselor with perfect knowledge verse two i know your works your toil I know your works. I know your toil. Jesus starts here with what looks like commendation, an encouraging compliment to the church at Ephesus. He says, I know your hard works. I know your toil. These people, the people at Ephesus, are hard working. They are hard working. You know, it's one thing I think I can say honestly and truthfully about people at the journey, more so than any church I've ever been a part of or led in my life, is that you guys are hard working. You give your time. You, 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 you toil. In fact, the, the Greek word here for toil is the idea that there's an agony involved. It's, it's hard. It's difficult. You have to strain, in a sense, to do all of the things that you're asked to do. You want to be a good husband, a good father, a good mother, a good wife. You want to do all the things that you should do and have your children involved in the right things. And yet you want to give good, sacrificial, generous service to the church of Jesus at the same time. Jesus knows it. He sees it. He sees your toil. He knows your works. So when you think that nobody knows, when nobody else recognizes, when nobody else has given you a pat on the back recently, Jesus knows. He sees your toil. He knows your works and your patient endurance. He says, I see your your work, your toil, and your patient endurance. The people of Ephesus are enduring hardship patiently. Verse 3 says, I know you're enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake. And you've not grown weary. You understood that it wasn't a sprint, that it was a marathon. And you started running with pace and you've kept it up and you've worked hard and and you've not grown weary. You still have your hands to the oars and you are are plowing against the water with all your might with those oars. And Jesus says, I see it and I know it. You're patiently enduring. You're working hard. You're enduring hardship. You see, at this time in the church at Ephesus, empire-wide persecution has broken out against Christians. This is during, most commentators believe, the the reign of Emperor Domitian. And about 95 AD is when Revelation was written. The Christians, you see, refused to participate in emperor worship. They refused to participate in worshiping Artemis and Zeus and Diana and all of the other pantheon of gods. They resist worshiping these things and worship Jesus alone as king. And so they're being persecuted for this. See, Ephesus was an extremely influential city located at the center of multiple trade routes. And so money was always pouring through the city of Ephesus. Affluence could be seen everywhere. The temple of Artemis is considered to be one of the the seven ancient wonders of the world. I could go through and describe all of the things, the pillars and all of these things. It was a monumental, magnificent building built to a demon. Built to worship a demon. All of the blessing that Ephesus 
experienced was attributed to Artemis. So long as Artemis was pleased with the worship of the people of Ephesus, she would keep blessing rushing through like a mighty river. There were as many as 50 gods and goddesses worshipped by the people in Ephesus, but Artemis' worship was more important than all of the other worship in the city. In fact, the city had formed a covenant, a covenant, an agreement, if you will, a binding agreement with the goddess Artemis to say, we will render the worship you want from us so long as you bless us. And so long as they rendered that worship, they believed Artemis continued blessing their city around the temple were temple prostitutes who were viewed as emissaries to the goddess and so good worship was to participate in activities with the temple prostitutes orgies of gross and unbelievable kinds of godliness went on in the common areas of the temple as many as hundreds of people might have been involved in sexual orgies at any given time and so worshiping artemis like this was supposed to bring on the blessing of artemis to the city and how did christians approach that how did the church at ephesus approach that well they weren't going to have anything to do with that they were standing well back of that they wanted to to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in that atmosphere. And so you might even remember back to the time when Paul was in Ephesus and caused a riot. Why? He was preaching Jesus, which was affecting people were being converted. People were coming to Christ in faith, no longer worshiping Artemis, which means they were no longer um, supporting the, the guildsmen, the craftsmen of the area who built little idols to Artemis and other gods and goddesses and these christians you say they only worship one god and he's not even represented by an idol they would have been happy to diversify and and create an idol of yahweh but god forbade that of course and so they couldn't make any money off these christians in their godless craft and so as the christians withdrew from all of this godless activity they were persecuted and jesus says i know it I know it's hard. I know your family has called you crazy. I know that your friends have abandoned you. I know that people are selling you out to the authorities. Now, we haven't reached that kind of persecution yet, but some of you have had family call you a fanatic, right? Because you really love Jesus and you're willing to follow him no matter what. And so your family thinks you're a little nuts. And they don't understand why you give money to the church. And they don't understand why you live in a particular place. And why you love a particular people. So some of you have experienced some kind of low-grade persecution. I, I believe that the persecution that we're experiencing now is, is, is only going to rise. If we look at the current state of things, and I'm not a doom and gloom preacher, okay? I'm not a naysayer. I don't believe that everything, the whole world's going to fall apart. I believe that the gospel will advance and prevail, and Jesus will do extraordinary things through the work of the gospel. But I believe that persecution is going to be amped up. I believe it will become more and more difficult to live as a Christian, and you need to know, be faithful, Jesus sees. Be faithful, Jesus sees knows some of us know a little bit about hardship for the sake of the gospel many of us don't know anything about it at all because you just keep your mouth shut you you don't say much about jesus in your workplace you don't say much about jesus in your neighborhood you don't live on mission to your friends and family and co-workers and people you recreate with because you don't want to be marginalized you don't want to be pushed to the side you don't want to be treated as if you're insignificant or have a few screws loose and so you just don't say anything well jesus has something to say about that too later And he says, I know how you don't stand for evil men, these false apostles, these leaders who would lead you astray. You put them to the test. You find out that they call themselves apostles, but they're not. These men do not teach the pure and true uh, gospel of Jesus Christ. You put them to the test. You found this out. Jesus says, I know. I know that you're doing all of this. They are guarding doctrine. 
They're theologically strong. You refuse the authority of those who would come in and put new restrictions on you. The book of Galatians and Colossians also addresses those who would come in and and build up new laws like the old Pharisees did. And that they would try to build up all of these restrictions and, and, and to restrain your liberties in Christ. He says, I know you don't put up with that stuff. The philosophical wranglings of those who would enslave you, you are solid. You know, I've been around most of you long enough to know I think we would fit in pretty well with this group. We'd fit in pretty well with this group. We are a theologically solid group, I believe. Many of you have been raised in environments where theological correctness was guarded. You know how to discern truth from error. You're like the people in Acts from the town of Berea. When Paul came through and preached that Jesus was the fulfillment of all Old Testament prophecy, it says they searched the scriptures to see that these things were so. They didn't just gullibly receive everything that Paul said. They searched the scriptures. You guys are like that. I can't stand up here and come up with off-the-wall crazy stuff because y'all will pin me to the wall. I know I have to stick with God's word, and of course I want to do that as well. You guys are, are, are sharp. You know the Order Salutis. You've read Augustine and Calvin. You know the five solas of the Reformation. You know the five points. You can explain the myriad problems with Mormonism. And you can make Jehovah's Witnesses cry with your scripture knowledge. Hoorah! It's awesome that we are as theologically solid, I think, as, as we are. I'm encouraged by that as your pastor. Deeply encouraged. So on the face of it, the doctrinal efforts of this early church shine brightly. On the face of it, the doctrinal efforts of our church shine brightly. I mean, what would we have without theological truth? Theology means simply the study of God. If we say that we love God, we need to know who he is, right? We need to understand him. We need to know about him so far as he's revealed that to us. We have to put ourselves to the study of God. We can't worship a God that we don't know. We do well when people say, I believe in Jesus, to ask which one? Because many portraits of Jesus are put forward in the media. Many portraits of Jesus are put forward in the church of Jesus today. A Jesus that isn't born out in the Gospels. And so we do well to say, which Jesus? Many of these people will say to him on the last day, Lord, Lord, didn't we do enough to earn your acceptance? And Jesus is going to say, you never understood me at all. I never knew you. And so we do well to press on doctrine, to press on solid theology. The church at Ephesus was solid or was serious about guarding a true doctrine of Jesus. They tested teachers. I like this church. I think I would have liked their atmosphere. I bet they had a book table set up for people to browse good works of gospel-centered authors. But, yeah, there's a but. Things weren't all good. Jesus says, but I have this against you, that you've abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. The problem is that they were loveless in Ephesus. Now, if you can see Meg Ryan's face and Tom Hanks, sleepless in Seattle, that's what I was going for, loveless in Ephesus. That was my trick today to get you to remember this whole thing. Got it? All right, now I can move on. They were loveless in Ephesus. So there's a temptation to read what we've looked at to this point. There's a temptation to read the letter to Ephesus as if there is a sizable list of good things and only one bad thing that they need to get wrapped up. There's a temptation to read the letter that way, to think Ephesus really was a solid church, really good church, really strong church. They just got one little area they need to work on. There's a temptation to read this letter that way. But in order to see this letter rightly, we have to read it in the context of the warning. Jesus says, what I have against you is so sizable. What I have against you is so significant. 
that if you don't get it right, I'll come take your lampstand. Church history says they didn't get it right. There are 3.5 million people who live in modern-day Izmir, which is ancient um, Ephesus. 3.5 million, I'm sorry, Izmir is Smyrna. Izmir is Smyrna. Um, I got that mixed up in my mind. There's like 2.5 million people who live in what is ancient Ephesus. You know how many Christians you can find in that place? Less than three dozen. I was in Turkey about eight years ago, and that country is so closed to the gospel. And there are times in church history where there was no recordable Christian presence whatsoever in Ephesus. Only because of recent church planning events is there any church at all there. So church history says they didn't get this fixed, and Jesus did remove their lampstand. These aren't empty warnings. When Jesus says, get this worked out, or I'm coming to take your lampstand, that's not an empty warning. It wasn't an empty warning to Ephesus. It's not an empty warning to the journey. So we do well to see it as, as significant. So Jesus says, I'll come and you won't be a church anymore. He's not simply saying that you have this one thing you need to get right. He is saying this. This is on your little note sheet. He is saying this, all that you do, because it's not motivated by love, is of no true gospel effect. Because the gospel is the good news of love. It doesn't matter that you test doctrine. It doesn't matter that you press false teachers. It doesn't matter that you can make false teachers run out with their tail between their legs. It doesn't matter that you're so solid. It doesn't matter that you've got all of these things because if you're doing all of those things and love is not the motivation, we, we understand that analogy of a house of cards, right? They fall whenever the wind blows just the right way and that's what's happening in Ephesus. We know that the gospel is the gospel of love. John 3.16, for God so loved the world. We are often motivated by a sense of obligation, aren't we? We're motivated by a sense of duty. In fact, the love that motivated us at one time gets sleepy and gives way to a sense of duty. A sense of obligation. And listen, duty is not a bad thing. A sense of obligation is not a bad thing. Obliging oneself to do particular things is not a bad thing. However, duty, if not driven by love, can ring pretty hollow, right? To fulfill obligations without a greater, deeper sense of gospel-driven love. The person and work of Jesus Christ in our lives. It's just to go through the motions without the motivations of true affection. One of the ways you know if your duty is compelled by love or not is to ask, do we grumble a lot about what we do for others in the church? Do we, do we complain about our service to the body of Christ? That's one of the ways that you know whether you have empty obligation, an, a hollow sense of duty, or whether your duty is motivated by gospel-driven love. One of the ways, do you complain about it? I, can, I think I can authoritatively say with the weight of Scripture that if you're always complaining about the service that you give, your motivation is not love. Jesus didn't walk all the way to the cross of Calvary going, I can't believe I have to do this. These sick, despicable people. Oh, I am so tired. So tired of this. Do we complain about what we have to do? Do we complain when we're on the nursery schedule? Again. Do we complain and grumble when we have to take a meal to somebody because they've been sick or because they've just had a child. Is it something, are these things that we have to do or are these things that we get to do? 
So if grumbling accompanies our service, you can be sure it's not love that's motivating us. Many churches will be incredibly active. Doing so much good in the community and conducting so many good programs in the church. But there's, uh, there's something intangible missing. You've been to those churches, right? And, and, and every, you walk in and everything is impressively done. There is a quality about everything. Kind of unlike the way we do some things here, right? Because we, we, we get by on some things and we do some things really well. But you go, you're just impressed. But you walk out and you go, I don't know. Something's missing. What is it? Well, oftentimes they're guilty of this too. They're loveless in their church. They're motivated by duty, motivated by obligation, but, but no love. 1 Corinthians 13 is an often sentimentalized passage of Scripture, but there really is some real meat to it. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians 13. I think it, I think it is... 1 Corinthians 13, to me, is the interpretive grid for Revelation 2, 1 through 7. It's how I interpret the letter to the church at Ephesus. 1 Corinthians... 13 we know it is the love chapter right paul says if i speak in the tongues of men and of angels but have not love i am a noisy gong or a clanging symbol natural gifts and spiritual gifts without love are of no lasting effect and if i have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and if i have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love i am nothing deep spiritual activity without love is futile it's hollow If I give away all I have and I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. Even martyrdom, even giving oneself up to die for the sake of the gospel without love is nothing. It gains nothing. It profits nothing. Why? Why is it all nothing? Why can't it count for something, right? I mean, what get partial credit, God? Right? We, you, you get the, the three-part question. Uh, you get two parts right and one part wrong. You're like, okay, partial credit. So why does it profit nothing? Well, in Genesis 126, we go back to the very, very beginning of the story, and God said, let us create man in our image. Let us create man in our image. Then Adam is given the command to be fruitful, to multiply, to cultivate. To cultivate. Why? Because God is fruitful and God is a cultivator. God created mankind in his image so that we would mirror his image. Right? Well, then we have this monumental text like 1 John 4, 8 that says God is love. So if we're made in the image of God and we're meant to mirror his image as cultivators, as fruitful people, what does that mean? It means that we are loving too. If God is loved, then we mirror that. And so our primary and chief motivations for all that we do are supposed to be love. Why? Because God is love. So love is a crucial element in the nature of God that propels us towards others. I heard a theologian one time make the argument that if God is not Trinity, God could not be love. Some denominations, some groups would see, you know, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, Jesus is a created being, the Son of God is a created being, there is no real Trinity, oneness, Pentecostalism uh, as well. So without Trinity, God can't be love. Why? Because love always, always exists in relationship. And if there was ever a time when there was not Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, then there was not this eternal dance of love that was continually going on between them throughout all eternity. God couldn't be love if he's not Trinity. 
God is love. So those who are born of God should love. Love should propel us towards others in all that we do. Now, a lot of commentators uh, look at uh, Revelation chapter 2, and they try to make sense of what kind of love is Jesus talking about. Is he talking about love for Jesus? Is he talking about love for the world, love for the lost, love for people in our church? What kind of love is he talking about? Well, it's not either or, it's both and. It's both and. It, it, it doesn't make a, a whole lot of, uh, it's not a whole lot of benefit for us to argue about which love he's talking about because when we love God, he propels us in love towards others. If we love Jesus with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, we are propelled into the second greatest commandment, which is to love our neighbors as ourselves, right? So we don't have to argue about which love he's talking about. It is a both and. It's not an either or. So Ephesus is a church that loves theology, but their love for God and others has waned. Mission has ceased to be important in Ephesus uh, because real affection has grown cold. Real affection has grown cold. Jesus is offended at the church at Ephesus. Jesus is offended at at the church in Ephesus because the love is gone. Good theology, vigilant testing of false teachers, patiently enduring suffering for Christ's name, and no love. This is tragic, right? Because God created us to mirror his image. He is love. In love, he created us. In love, he predestined us. In love, he sent his son. In love, he crushed him in our place. In love, he sealed us in the spirit. In love, he will raise us up with Christ. All that God does for his, all all that he does for the church is in love, in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So for us to do the work of the church out of some dutiful sense of obligation, I have to do this. I need to do this. I'm supposed to do this. For us to do these things without this primary, central motivation of love is for us to do it all for nothing. It's for us to do it all in vain. Is anybody here old enough to remember the gong show? I used to love the gong show. People doing different musical or talent acts, right? And just the absurd things they would do were crazy. They would either get a thumbs up or they'd get gonged, right? And booed off stage. I feel like God watches all of our activity, all of our theological astuteness. And if it's not, by, if it's not compelled by gospel love, we get gonged. Jesus here is gonging the church at Ephesus. He's saying you got so many things right, but you're doing all the right stuff for all the wrong reasons. It's tragic, isn't it? To be doing so much good, but the underlying motivation of it all to be wrong, which discredits all of it. In a very real sense, this is one of the most tragic letters of the seven. Of the five churches that receive really hard things from Jesus, this is one of the most tragic. We read the the letter, and we'll see this later, the the letter to the church at Laodicea. Really, really hard letter. Jesus had absolutely nothing good to say about them, whatever. Ends up saying, you're poor, miserable, blind, and naked. Okay, And they thought they were doing fine. But to me, in a very real sense, this letter is just as tragic as that because Ephesus is doing so much good, but for all the wrong reasons. They're expending themselves so much and so much labor and doing so much good, and yet it's all nothing. They're all nothing. He knows that they're loveless in this church. This is a text to show us how concerned God is with motivation. This was the problem with the Pharisees, wasn't it? All the way through the Gospels. They're always trying to do all the right things and keep all the rules and the traditions of the elders and everything else. But it it was not about their heart. Their heart was never engaged in it. It was not true affection. It was not the true emotion of the spiritual man that was producing these things out of relationship with God. 
It was all the problem for them. And oftentimes it's the problem for us because we think that all we got to do is do the right thing. Motivations aren't important, but God is incredibly concerned about our hearts. He is intensely concerned about our motivations. Jesus can say that they've left the love they had at first because he walks among them and he knows their hearts. He knows they're loveless. They're to point the way to to the God who is love and they aren't doing it in love. I think much of the modern Christian church suffers from this. I think much of the modern Christian church suffers from this. We would rather be right sometimes than loving. And I heard one pastor as I was listening to sermons on on this chapter, one pastor talked about it's interesting how some churches can seem to be so theologically correct and they really do have it all together and it's all right and they've got their systems and their processes and they know how to test false teachers and they know all of this kind of stuff and yet people aren't being converted there. People aren't coming to faith in Christ. Gospel change is not uh, overtaking people's lives. Marriages are not being healed. And, and those, those all, so much of that, it's not happening. And down the street, the church, it's kind of theologically a little wonky, a little kind of off kilter, a little to the weird side of things. And yet, people are getting saved. They're like crazy. And people are coming into relationship with Jesus. And, and, and there's a... There's just a, a, an overflowing robustness to, to the love that they have. Why is all that good taking place? Well, because they've got love. They've got some things that in time and the Holy Spirit and Scripture, and they'll get it worked out. But if you've lost love, it's hard to get that worked out. That's not just learning a new the- theological paradigm that gets us right in the whole love thing. So much of the church today is suffering from this. I think much of the world today is looking at the church and asking, where is the love? Where is the deep-hearted concern for people? I I mean, I've heard stories. Some of you told me things like some guy walks in, and maybe he's not dressed just right, and maybe he's barefooted, maybe whatever, and he comes in and he sits down in the church, and a deacon tells him, you can't be in here like this. And and they usher them out. I've heard countless stories of things like that. They might have been theologically pretty correct, but they were so destitute and poor in love that it was all for nothing. Some of the worst byproducts of religion are effects of love, are effects of a lack of love. The one that comes to mind is self-righteousness. It's born of a combination of of a lack of love and pride. And it develops a we-they mentality. We have got it together. We are right. We have Jesus. We have correct doctrine and theology. Those people out there. We develop that we-they mentality that we've looked so much at through the Gospel of Mark. That's what the Pharisees had, right? We don't want to be that church. We don't want to be those people. We don't want to be the people who've got right theology and no love and who develop this we-they mentality. Our hearts must be breaking for the lost, breaking for destitute, depraved sinners all the time. The hard thing about this whole subject is to know, right? Well, do I love? Have I, left the, have I left the love that I had at first? It's really hard to, to know whether or not this is something that plagues us. So this morning before I got up, I, I was simply laid in, in the bed, and this was something that came to me really late. I, just, I said, God, help me with a diagnostic question. Help me with something that, that I can ask. Help me with, with, with some questions that are going to help people to assess the state of their heart, that the Holy Spirit might use those questions pointedly to get at what's going on in people's hearts and so i asked him to help me and and i think this is the one diagnostic driving question in my head that formed this morning and i think it's a biblical one well i know it is 
It's this question. Do you do what Jesus commands? Do you do what Jesus commands? John chapter 14, verse 15, he said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. This may seem like a little bit of a circular argument, but, but what are the two greatest commandments? Love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. You see, we, we come back around, don't we? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. First and foremost, those commandments to love. People who say that they love but won't do what Jesus says do not love him. Period. We need to be careful to understand the whole of Scripture as Jesus' words to us, not just the words in red. When Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, he's talking about the book, y'all. Not just the words in red. He wrote the book. Yeah, he used men to do it, but God wrote the book. So are you aware of any command of Scripture that you regularly resist? Do you regularly share the gospel with people who are separated from God? That's the command of the Great Commission. Are you making disciples? Are you sharing the gospel? Acts 1-8, are you being witnesses? When you go, oh, well, you know, I, I live a good life and I'm trying to do the right thing. Are you sharing the gospel of Jesus with words to people who aren't yet converted? If you're not, you have a love problem. Now, remember, when I was laying in bed this morning, I asked God, um, he started giving me these questions. Uh, and it's not like I, you know, Jesus was sitting on my couch telling me this verbally. But um, these are biblical questions, so I feel comfortable saying that these are good diagnostic questions. But I asked him for questions that would cut. Are you sharing the gospel with people who are separated from God? If not, you have a love problem. You see, Jesus demonstrated love for both his father by fulfilling his mission to seek and to save the lost. And he demonstrates love for others in reaching them in their lost condition. Are you demonstrating that you love Jesus and others by giving them the gospel? Love compels mission. Jesus has orchestrated the world in such a way that love will generate gospel mission. So, if there is no gospel mission being generated in your life, you have a love problem. And then ask yourself, if your own mission, does this feel like a duty or an obligation? Or does it feel like the natural outworking of something in your heart? You know when something feels natural and feels good and it just kind of comes out, it just works its way out of something that's already there? Or is it something you really got to work hard to muster up? Do you generously give to your church and others in need? All of Jesus' teaching on how we use money, all of the Old Testament's teaching on tithing, Jesus talked an awful lot about money. We don't like it when people preach on it and people say things. I mean, some of you in your mind, you just clicked off the off button. You're like, there he goes talking about money. All right? Jesus talked an awful lot about money, didn't he? Way more than he ever talked about heaven or hell. Because money's a great diagnostic to find out where your heart's at. I love one of the things that John Piper often says is that God gave us money so that we might prove through the way we use it that it's not our God. If we're generously giving it away to the causes of God and Christ in the world, then we demonstrate that money's not my God. Jesus said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. This may be hard for some of you, but you need to ask the question. Here's the diagnostic question. Am I a person who generously gives to the mission of the church, which Jesus loves and died for? 
If you don't, you have a love problem. Y'all please come back next week. I'm not purposely trying to run people off. But does the money that you make terminate on your own needs as you get increases and raises and things get better at work? Do you just accumulate more stuff, nicer stuff? Or are you generously living, giving to the cause of Christ in the world? Or are you just increasing your standard of living? And if you give generously, does it feel like a duty? Does it feel like an obligation? Are you always thinking, I have to give this? Or is this, I get to give this? And you'll know whether or not you're doing it because love is working it out in your life. Do you care? Another last question. Do you care for the broken and discarded people of this world? Jesus spent a lot of time around people that respectable society had dismissed, disregarded, and marginalized, didn't he? Lepers, prostitutes, tax collectors, really bad people. When you see really bad people, do you cross on the other side of the street? like the men in the story of the Good Samaritan did, or do you go down to the ditch and share the gospel with them, love them, care for them, meet their needs, love them? Do you care for the broken and discarded people of this world? James one twenty five says that pure and God-loving, undefiled religion is to visit the widow and the orphan in their distress. People that society has discarded, are they on your radar? Do you love them? Do you care for them? Do you spend time with them? And this is a big question for our church. This is a big question for our church. And I think I have a pretty clear answer of, of how we stand currently. What are we currently doing to reach out to and love the broken and discarded people of this world? I'm going to answer for you. As a church, we're doing nothing. And that's tragic. That's tragic. Everything, every day. Every dime that we take up as a church right now terminates on the needs of this church. All of the ministry that we do right now terminates on the needs of the body of Christ. It is tragic that we are failing to care for the broken and discarded people of this world. We're not demonstrating love for Jesus because the impulse to love the impulse to love people like this is not present in us or we would be doing it. If it existed, we would be doing it. So I'm, I'm certain of the fact that we stand as a church who should receive the warning of Jesus Christ substantially and weighty to our congregation because what are we doing? Nothing in this regard. Now I'm not saying that you as individuals may not do something at at, at times and in seasons, and, and praise God for that. But as a church, we're not doing it. And these are just a few questions stemming from the big question. Do you do what our Lord and Savior commands? Jesus says, if you love me, you'll do what I command. I think we've seen, every one of us, how we're implicated in one way or another, haven't we? Have I missed any of you? I can come up with a question for you. Verse 5, remember, therefore, from where you've fallen, repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. What's the remedy for lovelessness in our hearts? I'm going to hit them very quickly. Number one is remembrance. He says, remember, therefore, from where you've fallen. Where had they fallen from? They've fallen away from a close proximity to the person and work of Jesus Christ. They're not continually being reminded of the infinite costliness of their salvation. They're not continually being reminded of the blood that ran red down the cross of Calvary. They're not continually being reminded of the stripes that Jesus received across his back for their salvation. And if we grow loveless, one of the reasons is because we're not remembering well what Jesus has done to secure us for himself. From where have we fallen? We'll fall away from the love that we had at first if we don't continually see the person of Jesus as glorious and bright and brilliant and at the same time crushed and despised of men and bleeding out on a cross for us. 
You see, if we see his work in simply a systematic way, if we see it as simply something that could affect our salvation and not the passion of Jesus for his people and his church, then we will remain loveless. If the salvation that Jesus Christ has secured for us remains a theological system rather than a deep impression in our hearts that God died for me, then we'll remain loveless. Sometimes we need to quit explaining how it happened, right? And just celebrate the fact that he died for us. Because he loves us. So we need to be reminded continually. I really see it as my task every Sunday, week after week after week. You won't hear me quit talking about Jesus all the time because he's the center of what we do and it's his love that should drive and compel us. So I'm always going to be reminding you of the blood that ran red. I'm always going to be reminding you of the crown of thorns. I'm always going to be reminding you of the cost that was paid. Next. Beyond remembrance is repentance. He says, remember. He says, then he says, repent. We have to repent of having fall away, fallen away from nearness to Jesus. When Jesus saw Peter on the beach after he had risen, Jesus asked him three times, Peter, do you love me? Remember that? What was he trying to do? Was he really trying to rub Peter's nose in it? Was he really just trying to crush Peter with the weight of his failures in denying Jesus? I really don't think so. I think he wanted him to feel the weight of it, yes, so that his repentance would be robust and full, but also so that he could get washed clean of it. To, to get washed clean of the shame and disgust of it. Do, are you ever disgusted? with yourself let's be honest are you ever disgusted with yourself when god presents you an opportunity to do something that is loving and good but you're selfish and you do your own thing and so later you feel a weight you feel a, an impulse of disgust run to jesus he will wash that clean he did that on the cross he washed our shame, our guilt, our disgust. He, he, he cleanses us. And so Jesus was healing Peter each time he asked him, Peter, do you love me? And yes, he would feel the weight of it. He would be driven to a robust repentance. And then he would be cleansed by the work of Jesus on the cross. You see, Jesus had cleansing ready. He had mending ready for Peter. Peter wept. He was crushed and he was mended with every question. Repentance means to turn away from sin, but in our turning away, we're turning towards something, aren't we? We're turning towards God in the face of Jesus. This is the cyclical work of the gospel, to repent of sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. All over again. Today, afresh. In an hour from now. All day. So there's, they were to remember, they were to repent, and then they were to be driven to action. He says, do the deeds you did at first. You know what? I think, I think they were the same deeds they were already doing in many regards. G, uh, Paul told them in, in, uh, in Ephesus, or I'm sorry, in Acts chapter 20, he told the elders at the church of Ephesus, you better be ready. False teachers are going to come. You're going to have to test them. They're going to be like wolves who are going to try to destroy the flock. It's apparent that they had tested false teachers. They were doing that well. Jesus says, do the deeds you did at first. But those first deeds were motivated by love. Those first deeds were motivated by love. What you're doing now is no longer motivated by love. So get back to those first things again. After being reminded of Jesus and his work, after repenting thoroughly of our lovelessness, then we are compelled to action. Do the deeds you did at first. The active work we're compelled to arises from gospel-driven love. To wind up this section, he says in verse 6, Yet you have this, you hate the work of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. 
nobody knows who the Nicolaitans were. I've listened to 500 commentators, 50 sermons. They have different suggestions, but all of them admit we really can't be sure. This is some group of false teachers who might have been teaching people to embrace immorality. They might have been teaching that the law is of no effect. Who knows? He says, you hate bad work, and I hate it too, which is good. There are things that Christians are supposed to hate. There are things that Jesus hates. Hate fault, that which is false, that which is an error. And then he says, he who has an ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Conquering for this church, conquering for the Ephesian church, is to do the deeds of true religion that's motivated by gospel-driven love. The result, he says, is eternal life. You'll get to eat of the tree of life in the paradise of God. And it sounds almost like works-based religion, doesn't it? Jesus says, go do all this stuff and you'll get to go to heaven. But Jesus isn't saying, do this and you'll be accepted. He is, however, saying, if your faith is not accompanied by the deeds of gospel faith, then your faith is vain. Martin Luther was famous for saying, we are saved by faith alone, but not a faith that is alone. Our faith is accompanied by works motivated by the gospel. So folks, Jesus is speaking to us this morning individually and corporately. And I'm thankful that you've given me your attention for this long. I know that I'm running long. But let me plead with you to remember, to repent, and do the deeds you did at first. Our church needs to take heed to this. Let's pray.